Welcome back, book nerds. It's Angie, and on today's episode of the podcast, I will be speaking with Catherine Prescott, writer and director of the short film Jane, which is being showcased at the 2020 Holly Shorts Film Festival. Catherine Prescott is an English actress best known for her role as Emily Fitch in the double BAFTA winning teen drama Skins. Catherine is now stepping behind the camera and has written and directed two short films. Without any further delay, let's jump into the podcast. Hi there, book nerds. Welcome to today's episode of the podcast with Catherine Prescott. Thank you so much for joining me today, Catherine. Hi, thank you for having me. Now, for our listeners that aren't familiar with you, can you please introduce yourself as well as the film, um, Jane? Uh, My name is Catherine Prescott, and I wrote and directed uh, the short film called Jane. Um, It stars Gail Rankin, and it centers around a woman who's suffering from heroin addiction on the day and living in a residential hotel on the day she receives an invite to her estranged daughter's birthday party. And as the writer and director, what inspired you to make this film? Um, I, I'm always like interested in stories that um, have people suffering from addiction. Um, at the heart of them, especially when those stories, I mean, I'm just interested in addiction in general. Um, It's something that has kind of touched the lives of some of the people closest to me. And it always kind of irks me how it's portrayed in film and and the media, not all the time, but I just think there's this image of people suffering from it as like, it's, it's pretty negative and they're often the villain or they're, you know, even the word like addict is used as kind of like a derogatory thing anyway. So I wanted to write something with someone who was suffering from addiction as the lead and not necessarily as either a victim or a villain. Um, and I had I had worked on a needle exchange bus for a, just a little while in Austin and met some women who were, um, you know, suffering from um, opiate addiction. And some of their stories were so heartbreaking um and you know like the way some of them end up um addicted to heroin from pills from an injury and it you know losing custody of their daughters and or sons and I kind of wanted to tell a story it's no one's particular story that I met it's just kind of like loosely based on on some of the things I heard and a couple of um people I know personally who've who've gone through it similar things um yeah originally she was gonna Jane was gonna be living in her car um and then I had moved to downtown Los Angeles and when I was like in the initial stages of writing it and I was living next door to a single room occupancy hotel and I got to know some of my neighbors and I was like this is really interesting I didn't even know that like residential hotels existed Mm -hmm. Um, as a form of low-income housing in uh, to the degree uh that they do and I just thought that was that was a a world that I hadn't really seen a film set in and it was um more interesting to me than uh and I was finding it quite difficult to write a story about a woman living in her car um and I decided that that would that was where I wanted to set it instead yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I didn't get to throw it in earlier, but I love the film, what you did with it. And it was really nice to see a different perspective, as you were saying, that you wanted to bring to it. And I hope everyone who got to watch it at Holly Shorts enjoyed it. And I hope people are able to watch it in the future because it's very heartwarming, but somber at the same time. And I, I don't even know how else to describe it there. <laughs> There goes my cat. I'm sorry. She's distracting me. (laughs) Um, But it was just a beautiful story that you told. And um, thank you for diving into that new perspective that you said you you don't really see a lot in uh, the media for. That didn't make sense as it came out of my mouth, but it's okay. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, it was a beautiful film. Um, and you were saying you were having trouble writing the story. How long did it take you to write the script? 
Um, I have OCD. I mean, I'm, I say this, but I'm sure like most writers, most people who write stuff have the same thing, but just like I'll write draft after draft after draft after draft. Um, and I, and that was like the first narrative project I, I'd ever written. <clears throat> and I remember I, I think the first version that I was like ready to shoot probably took me at least six months on and off to write. Not like that wasn't all I was doing, but that's mm -hmm. how long it, it took me, I think. And then we were about to shoot it. And I, I had gotten like a few notes back from a few different people and just decided that it wasn't ready to shoot. And so we stopped and then I waited a whole other year um, and then we shot it. So a long time, but it wasn't all just me writing it. It was me uh, obsessing and then, and then deciding not to shoot it, yeah. Oh, it definitely. And your the film has to do a lot with what's left unsaid. So I really enjoyed that, that you kind of just have to watch it and take everything in as it comes. The dialogue, of course, when it's used is necessary and helps move the story along. But what was it like directing the film when there wasn't any dialogue? Were you able to, you know, direct them as the cameras were rolling or how did that work for you? Yeah, I mean, I felt sorry for our for for Gail because there was a lot of stuff where there was no dialogue, but the whole scene was like a series of actions. Um, so it was like she was having to remember, like, look this way and then look this way and then do this action and do this action. And there were no prompts. I mean, she did it all, obviously, but it was it just like dawned on me, like during the shoot, that that was actually probably quite difficult. And um Though from my perspective as the director, um, I def like there were there were a couple scenes where we had like a little bit of dialogue, and those were not not harder. They just took longer, and I remember being like, "Oh, I'm glad I didn't write more dialogue in here because I was feeling like it needed more dialogue for a long time." And then we got to set, and I was like, "No, I think if we had more of this, would you know." putting the like quality of the project aside just for like my ease on set it made things um slightly easier to shoot just because getting the right performance when there are no words is I think slightly easier and slightly less time consuming and on a short that's obviously like that's obviously really helpful um what was the question why did did that yeah, like, were you able to direct Gail as she oh, was, yeah, you know, so, doing it? Yeah, there was some, there were some moments where I could um, say, like, okay, and now can you do this? And now can you do that? Um, but I think, like, it, I tried not to, because I think that's, like, hard as an actor when you're, like, trying to be in the moment and the director mm -hmm. is like, now look this way. And you're like, oh, what? Like, so, um, yeah. Oh, definitely. And uh, you probably have the experience yourself um, <laughs> being both in front of the camera and behind the camera now. So you had that perspective to kind of, you know, lead her in the direction you wanted. Mm -hmm. And she did amazing, by the way. Her performance was astounding. Like, I loved it. And she she just did so good. <laughs> like, I don't even know what else to say. She did yeah. amazing. She was so good to work with. She, I thought, yeah, she was amazing. Is there a specific moment in the film that you have a soft spot for? Um, I really like the moment where the little girl on the bus um, does this, does her like, oh wait, my, I shouldn't spoil it, but there's a moment, <laughs> the little girl on the bus like um, turns and smiles and um, and my editor and I, there was this one face that she pulls like right after she does the smile and she sticks her tongue out, which is like, like that. And it's like, a, my editor made a meme of it and sent it to me when, when I was like stressed about the edit and stuff. And it was like, you got this or something. Cause the face she pulls is so, um, I don't know that, that she was great and that, that one moment now makes me smile forever because whenever I see it, I, th I think of that that meme and that, yeah, how much joy there is in her in that little one moment. 
Yeah, her li- her little facial expressions were so good as well. So oh, sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> it happens. I'm gonna turn this off. Okay, sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> sorry, you said um. So, one. what was it like finding the children to be in the film? I'm sure there's a lot of talented little bodies out there. Um, <laughs> how was that like? It was um. It's always interesting. I mean, I've not done obviously any anything else before, but I always, when I've worked with uh, child actors, it was it can be like strange because it's like this is such an adult environment for like this child to be in, and it's always like I I always have been like a little bit not uncomfortable. Just I've always just been aware that like this child is like working and is surrounded by adults, and so. Um, I was like a bit hesitant to put so many I like I felt bad about putting so many kids in the film because because of that but our um, casting director was amazing and we you know worked with kids who um, the the, the little girl who plays Mia I I believe this was her first um, job and I she seemed to be yeah, it was, I, she was excited about being on set and it didn't feel like, I don't know, like it sometimes, I don't know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say anything bad about that. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, she was, she was great. And um, then uh, Emma, who plays, uh, who plays the little girl on the bus was like incredible. And they both actually, I was so scared about working with kids because of ev- what everyone says about working with kids and like how, how much more time it takes and, and stuff. And while I can see that being a, an issue, I think I had over-prepared mentally for that being the most stressful part of the job. And it, and it really wasn't on, on this one. Um, I'm sure it, it may be in future, but um, yeah, we, we, I mean, it was just a general casting call that's how that's how we found them we and some of them came in and did and did like a little moment um in the in the casting office but um yeah it was pretty standard in terms of casting yeah that I that's really interesting and um I'm glad you were able to kind of over prepare for the moment to work with kids because now you're like now you can relax a little next time maybe um, <laughs> <laughs> false sense of security maybe it is the little just a little. yeah <laughs> but now you have that experience with children and I hope the future children you work with are equally as amazing <laughs> um what was it like filming on the bus because like were you guys actually driving I'm always curious about that like were you actually driving or were you just like making the camera look bumpy that that's so- just so interesting we were on that bus like it was it was in I think Van Nuys or or Burbank I think we were driving around and I think it was the last thing we shot either on because we shot for two different weekends and I it was either the last thing we shot on the first weekend or the second weekend and we were like losing light like really quickly we were working with a with a child and Gail had an emotional performance to do and it was hot and there was no AC. And so it, it could have been really awful and crazy. And it maybe it was, and I just can't remember properly, but I have this like rosy image of, of how it was because again, I think I had prepped for it to be so awful and stressful and everybody just was like, I mean, it is, was stressful, but the, you know, Emma, the little girl was like really na- nailing it and like on it and was not getting distracted by all of the craziness around her. Gail was really on it and like, I don't think we did that many takes. I don't think we could, but it was, um, yeah, it was a lot. Like it was fun, but it was a lot. The bus is full of people like craning and like trying to squeeze in different places. And um, yeah. Yeah, I can only imagine with your whole crew on there, but while also trying to make the bus seem really empty, it must have been very tight. That's crazy. Yeah. But yeah, everyone, uh, yeah, every, I was just lucky to be working with so many people who genuinely seemed to like want to, like no one was sort of like complaining or stressed too much. Everyone was kind of putting their best foot forward and, and like working as a team. And I, I really felt that on that bus the most because everyone must have been miserable. <laughs> <laughs> 
and you said it was hot and i know buses can get super stuffy so, so hot. yeah so. the good thing is you were able to film it pretty fast yeah yeah i mean we were forced to which was the other good thing we had like an hour to like get it quickly before the light was going to be gone um so i guess that was like kind of a blessing in disguise maybe it was kind of just like a go 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 yeah yeah <laughs> And um, there's a moment in the film where Gail is getting in the shower. Did you actually have her go in cold water that I was really interested? Like, was that her genuine reaction? Oh, God, now you say that, I can't. You know what? I think it was. I think it was because I remember because we had the ability to get the shower warm my God, I can't remember. But I feel like that was her natural reaction to cold to cold. Now I'm thinking back again, I've like blocked so much out of this memory, my memory, because I think I was so tired and stressed that it's like gone. But um, God, I can't remember. But yeah, I, I think it might may have been cold. I think Kale might have asked for it to be actually cold so that she could get like the proper proper reaction but um yeah I apologize if I'm if I'm lying about that my memory is not serving me <laughs> no you're fine I do the same thing in stressful situations I kind of just get through it and I forget about everything <laughs> yeah. is that about childbirth like pain the pain of childbirth women are like um naturally we're like we have evolved to like forget the pain of childbirth otherwise because if we really remembered it no one would do it twice yeah I've seen that around I just saw that recently actually and I was just like oh <laughs> yeah scary scary thought yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the end credits are accompanied by the song different drum by which is by the stone ponies did you have that song specifically in mind for the end credits or was it just something that came along with the project? Um, I was listening to, um, I, I'm like really bad at technology and um, I had I had just discovered when I was writing Jane, I had just discovered that what's it called Discover Weekly on Spotify. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I was just listening to all my like Discover Weekly playlists and not realizing like I know nothing also about music and I was listening to this song and I was like, oh my God, this would be so good. Like this band that I'd like, in my head, I, I didn't know they were like such a huge band that like everybody knew and everybody knows who Linda is. And, and anyway, I was like, oh my God, this song is amazing. It would be so perfect. This like old song. And I showed, everyone I showed was like, I mean, yeah, that's a really famous song. It's, it's great, but it's like, you didn't discover, just, it's not some like unknown artist. And maybe I shouldn't say that actually, but um, but yeah, so I had had that in my head like so much since, the, since writing it. And then I found it really hard to find a different um, song to, that would go in, in place of it because, because I love that one so much. Um, which I have to stop doing, like stop listening to to playlists when I'm writing something because I get locked on and then it's, that's it, yeah. It helps you create the story as well, so I don't blame you. <laughs> like sometimes if I'm running and listening to music, that's when I get the ideas for things. So yeah, it definitely helps. And just to make you feel better, I'm going to be honest, I didn't know about the song until I watched the film. Um, once I saw Linda Ronstadt sang it, I was like, I felt like, why didn't I know this existed? Yeah. But I thought it was a great song to parallel everything that we had just seen in the film. And I went to go listen to the song in full because I knew there was a reason you chose it. Just because, you know, as I said, the film is really somber and, you know, heartbreaking at times. But then the end credits come on and you get this like upbeat song and you're just like, what's happening? And the line that really stood out to me in the song is towards the end where she's like, she says something about living apart or something. And that was immediately what reminded me of the film. I don't even know if that was a subconscious thing because I've thought about that line a lot and it happens, it like, the, it, it ends kind of near that line. It's like, I think we'll be better if we live apart. The line mm -hmm. is... And I, maybe I was like subconsciously picking that up when I was listening to the song thinking like, oh, this would be great for Jane because the, the theme is like, 
like loving someone, but like deciding that maybe you're you're better apart for now kind of thing. And that ultimately is the basically what happens in the film. Um, that's interesting though that you you no one else has no one else has said that. So no one else has picked that up. I feel special. <laughs> But yeah, because I, I was like, there's a reason they chose such an upbeat song. So I went to go listen to it. And that line immediately reminded me of the film. So I went to go watch the film again. It was like a back and forth. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> a moment in the film where you created this parallel with like, maybe people caught up on it faster than I did. But the wardrobe choice for Jane in the in the um the white trouser and the pencil skirt was that intentional like did you have that specific outfit in mind for her to kind of like you know put on to like showcase that that's the mom she wishes she could be I hope that's not a spoiler but no. I mean it was a beautiful po- parallel by the way again not not everyone like not everyone see, sees that but that was something like that was actually an example of something that I thought was going to be like really clear on camera, like, cause it is exactly the same outfit, that, but I guess like one of the learning, one of the things I learned from, from making this was that like, there's only so much like visual, there only so much like stuff you can pick up from one shot. So if you show a shot where like, Oh, she's wearing the same outfit, but also she's like doing something else. And this thing is in the background. Like, people aren't gonna like get every single thing and think that every single thing they're seeing is important. Anyway, that's a long winded way of saying that yes, it was It was very intentional in the script I had written. She's wearing the exact same outfit as the mother she saw in the store. Um, so that's cool that you. Yeah, I, I didn't pick it up until the final bus scene that the mom walked in and I was like, wait, it's the same outfit so I thought it was genius <laughs> and wh- what was it like filming that you were able to get the streets so empty like where did you have a lot of early mornings and like late well it's not late nights because it was like afternoonish. so yeah we had really early mornings and um and we were shooting in December so we were losing light at like 4 p.m so we had to start really early and everything was like day exterior so we had to start really early um where did we have empty streets because we you mean like when she's walking home in the morning and stuff yes the beginning um part of the film that was so early in the morning like i forget when but i remember we were fighting sunrise so it was like i remember we showed up to that yeah it was really we showed up and it was like really early in the morning and we were just waiting for it to get light enough to shoot and then we had like a few takes before it was then too bright to shoot so no no one I mean that's an empty area that was in like the fashion district of like near downtown LA and so it's pretty empty anyway except on on weekends and right in the middle of the day but Mm -hmm. yeah super early how many days did it take you guys to shoot the entire film um it was four days in total um we uh, over two different weekends so gail was shooting glow um during Mm -hmm. um and then uh coming and doing (laughs) doing the short two weekends in a row um but that's how how we made it work with our schedule yeah that's and you got a break in between so that's good as well (laughs) yeah (laughs) well gail didn't unfortunately we did yeah but she did amazing as I said before so it all worked out (laughs) yeah did anything go wrong during filming because I know there's this I forget what my professor calls the uh, law but it's like if something can go wrong it will go wrong I'm trying to think someone asked me this the other day and I like couldn't I'd like again I think it's something if it did it I like I'm like things did but I think I blanked a lot of them because I was so stressed and not sleeping but um, I think right before like the night before the shoot we like almost didn't get the camera because the something with the insurance we hadn't like done something with the insurance hadn't gone through and and without the insurance we couldn't get the camera and so it was like the 11th hour and someone was like guys we, we may not be able to pick up a camera tomorrow or tonight so that was something Oh yeah. Uh, well, I guess there was some stuff right 
right before we shot, we need we found out that in order to we had to completely change the location of the bus stuff um, because there was a rule whereby you couldn't take the um, rented bus too far away from the the rental place or something, or it was extra money or something. And so we had to like completely re like me, me and my um, DP were driving around the whole of LA, just like looking what might work for a new location for that bus thing, like two days before we were shooting. Um, it, we found it really hard to find a department store. That was like something we, we like didn't have until like, like a few days before shooting, I think, because we just couldn't find one that didn't want like tens of thousands of dollars to, to shoot in it. Um, yeah, we went and saw one of the buses and it had, this is boring stuff, but it had like a coating on the windows that they were like, oh yeah, it takes, it's going to cost three grand to get rid of that coating on the windows. And then we had to change the bus. So lots of like silly, boring things went wrong, but nothing absolutely crazy happened on the actual days of shooting. It was all prior to it. Uh, okay. I mean, at least that's the good thing that everything was kind of like the storm and then the rainbow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But how how are you liking the virtual film festivals? Um, right now we're doing the interview for Holly Shorts and everything's virtual. How how do you feel about everything? I like them. It obviously like doesn't compare to to being there in person. I think Holly Shorts um, was has been one of the best ones in terms of like how they've uh, how they've um, created this like online platform where like filmmakers can still meet and hang out and like they've been doing a lot of zoom hangouts which are obviously like nothing compared to actually meeting in person but it does really make a difference when you know you get I mean for me part of the you know most of the reason why going to festivals is so great is because you get to meet other filmmakers who are kind of at your level and you know, I didn't go to film school, so I don't have this like natural network of loads of film people. And that was something I was really looking forward to. So yeah, it's been great. It's been sad to miss a lot of them, but it's been great when the ones, you know, when they do do the online uh, networking things. I've met some really cool people. Yeah, definitely. And um, I'm in film school, but (laughs) uh, it's interesting how you say you didn't go to film school. So did you pick up most of like your knowledge while you were um, acting and kind of just rolled with it and learned from people on set. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I say like, I didn't go to film school. Like that was some like huge disadvantage, but I am also like extremely privileged in that I like came up in acting and was lucky enough to work in that world to the point where like I could even see, you know, those other professions that I might want to get into um, and meet some people through the acting. Like some of the people that worked on Jane I'd met through um, work I'd done as an actress. Um, and yeah, my, my DP had a lot of, um, friends in film who were, you know, doing this as a favor. Um, but yeah, in terms, like, in terms of how I started, it really was just from acting and then being on set for so long and and being kind of jealous of the, of, of the writers and the directors and feeling like, um, though the actors are part of obviously like telling the story, like an important part of telling the story. Um, You are there as an actor to help facilitate someone else's vision. Um, And that's great. But I was kind of finding that I wanted to also um, be part of the kind of determining what kind of story was being told and as an actor that's not super your place um so I still love acting but there's something about writing and directing obviously it feels like you have more control and I really like that no definitely and I bring up film school because yeah like we network in film school and we're like trying to network everywhere but you were also able to network so I just wanted to point that out to you too like so you can feel better that you were networking as you were acting Yes, exactly. Yeah, there are other ways to to do it. And earlier you mentioned you want to see more representation about addiction in the media. And I have to ask, what are your thoughts about HBO's Euphoria? I have seen not very much of you. I've seen half an episode of Euphoria, so I'm not sure I can super speak to it. 
Um, okay. Is it, does it uh, touch on themes of Oh, definitely. The main character, Rue, which who is played by Zendaya, she is a teenage addict, and it's kind of her just um, finding a way to recover from a recent overdose and kind of like trying not to slip and fall. It's, And I mean, that's just one of the topics that gets covered. There's a little bit of everything, and it's honestly a really great show, so if you get a chance to watch it, definitely do. <laughs> Maybe I should, I fell asleep during the first episode, not because it was boring or I didn't like it, but because I was that tired and have not returned to it, but maybe I should. I did actually, there was a show um, on Showtime called Patrick Melrose, like a couple, I think it was a couple years ago now, that was about a man who was um, played by Benedict Cumberbatch about, uh, and he was, what was it? He was struggling with, um, yeah, he was struggling with addiction and relapse. Um, right at the beginning and it's I think they did like a really fantastic job of show like it switches between his present and his past and I think that's a really um delicate thing to tread but I think they did a really great job of showing how his past experiences um really fed into to maybe why he's has struggled with addiction for so long and but without putting too much of a judgment on it and I don't know I just think they handled it really well and I thought they they um he wasn't demonized in the way that a lot of um people or not at least in the in the tv show itself but potentially still by the people around him anyway I think they did a great job of portraying that no definitely and you mentioned it talks about the why and I feel like there's still not enough representation about that in the media because it's kind of just like they're an addict and that's it. They don't really deal with the the touchy topics on like why they're still um, in the situation they're in and, you know, what it really means for them to become sober and everything. Is that a project you hope to work on in the future? The Just the why part? I mean, I hope so. I it's it's tough because I feel like it's so hard to tell a story that like that's why I think they did such a good job on that show because it's so I think so hard to tell a story explaining backstory. Like I feel like in order to tell a compelling story, a lot of the time you have to be like revealing backstory through things that are happening in the present. So it's hard to be to sort of. I think in documentary, you've got more of a chance to be like, okay, this person's like this because of this, because you're not trying to create that like full, well, I don't know, I've never made a documentary, but not, <laughs> well, not made like a, a proper full length documentary. But I, yeah, it's, I think it's a hard thing to do, at least for me in, in narrative stuff to like overtly explain the why without it becoming like almost like medicinal, like, do you know what I mean? Like, but um mm -hmm. I think just showing showing the other sides of someone's character who's struggling with addiction now can also serve that same um, thing. Because I think we think of addiction really as like the thing that's wrong in someone's life. And at least in my experience with the people close to me who've, who've been suffering with it, it's, it's the result of something else. Like there's a, there's a bunch of other stuff going on and someone is like, it's, the addiction comes second it then becomes the main problem in their life that they have to fix first before they can even start fixing the other stuff that caused the addiction um mm. i mean i'm not an expert i'm talking about it like i am but that's just been my experience and so it's hard to watch or even hear people be described as like junkie or crackhead and you're like okay but that's someone in like really deep pain that's mm. trying desperately to like stop being in pain anyway so yeah I hope no, like that yeah and I absolutely adore your passion for this topic because it's just really inspiring and um, um I really admire your your passion for the topic and I was wondering if maybe you go to those friends and ask them for like little tidbits of their personal stories to kind of include in your art 
Yeah. I mean, my, so it's, it's tough. Cause like, I would never want to be like, just sort of, sort of like milking someone else to their story for, for art. But I do think that, um, yeah, again, it's a fine balance between like telling the stories that are yours to tell. Um, mm -hmm. I've personally um, experienced uh, drug addiction. Um, so I try to kind of speak to as many people that I know who have and, and try and not directly tell those experiences or those stories, but use them to inform the stories that I do want to tell. And everything that I um, imagine, every story that I imagine telling that is kind of like revolves around that topic is no one person's story. It's like an amalgamation of different parts of other people's stories. Um, and, you know, like, yeah, I, I do, I sort of talk to the, you know, family members and friends that I um, have who've struggled with it. Um, I actually lost a friend um, from, uh, to, not directly from opioid addiction, but it, uh, it like led to it and he was a consultant on the I made a PSA about opioid addiction and he was a consultant on that and he worked in the crew and so um yeah I think it's important to include to like do your research properly and then include the people that actually have had lived experiences when you're telling those stories especially if you personally haven't got that direct first person insight no, definitely. And I think that's one thing about film and media in general is that sometimes the stories are being told in, they're just not told genuinely. And you can really feel in your, in your film that you really cared about the topic and you want it to, you know, explore that area. And it just, it didn't feel like cliche or anything. It was just very natural. And kudos to you for being able to you know portray that so so flawlessly thank you that means a lot <laughs> <laughs> definitely and we're gonna like flip the tables from like serious to kind of a little funny tidbit but I did you guys eat the, the birthday cake <laughs> <laughs> my she was working uh with us on that she took the birthday <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say this she's <laughs> the birthday cake to her friend um and told her friend that she like got it for her or something like she she took because we had two of this cake like and she took the one that hadn't been like uh cut into to her friend for her birthday and maybe pretended like she'd had it made for her not stolen it from from set where it'd been sitting out all day um but it went to use yep <laughs> okay Hopefully they don't listen to this, but <laughs> that's just so funny. <laughs> Kids that we that were at the birthday party were eating the, the the actual prop cake, and then the backup prop cake went to a good home in, in the form of this girl's birthday party. So to it got to go the backup prop cake still got used in a birthday setting, so that's always good. <laughs> Filled its life purpose as birthday cake. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> And do you have any advice for aspiring filmmakers and actors since you have, you know, the insight on both worlds? Um, for aspiring filmmakers, um, uh, I would say there are a lot of free resources. Well, not free, but not free. But <laughs> um, resources that are available that are cheaper than film school. Um, I'm not, not just shit on film school. I think it's like an incredible thing go to film school go to film school but um if you can't go to film school you you know I learned a lot of the stuff that I everything I know from speaking to people from listening to podcasts reading books about it um I like masterclass has a, has a few really good um a good class good classes on filmmaking and writing that have been so helpful um script notes podcasts I mean if, if if people listen to this or are already into film, they probably already know all of these things, but script notes has been like really instrumental in helping me um, with writing. Um, there's one episode that Craig Mason does on his own and it's called, I think if you Google like Craig Mason, how to write a movie and he's literally like going through just his um, kind of perspective on it. But that was probably the single most helpful um, piece of uh 
of like like resources resource that I found for writing, um, especially if you're stuck with with why something's not working. Um, I would say like reach out. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> she just decided to sit next to me. <laughs> reach out to people even if you think like say you want to just like I don't know I, people are slightly more accessible than than you think they are and if you're just looking for advice or um I don't know like people are available I think more than you think that they are and don't be scared to reach out yeah definitely um I think that's one of the things we all have to learn is just to ask for help when we need it yeah film film festivals actually even if I never thought about this before I before I was with Jane but I since since being at some of them I was thinking how much how beneficial they are even if you don't have a film in the festival to watch the films in the festival and then like see who directed them see who made them to see people who are like just beginning their kind of like careers in filmmaking because if you also are like just beginning and you need like a dp but you don't want to reach out to someone who's like giant and who may not be free or willing to do a short film definitely reach out to that giant person but then also you know finding those like people who are just starting at the film festivals i think is a has been really helpful for me anyway no, definitely. And has Jane screened at other film festivals? Yeah, Jane, we've, we've been really lucky. Jane, Jane screened at um, quite a few now. I think uh, we premiered at Austin Film Festival mm-hmm. last year. And then we've screened at, screened at Palm Springs, um, Aesthetica in the UK, um, LA Shorts. Uh, what else? Oh, Short Shorts in Asia which was which was like one of the one of the really cool experiences um even though we didn't get to go to japan um but yeah we've been lucky it's, it's done like several cool festivals uh, which i didn't imagine <laughs> are, are we looking forward to more festivals for jane in the future yeah jane i think it's so the next one is phoenix film festival i think is happening uh, this at the end of this week jane's screening there and then um there's a couple others that it's screening out of. I've like, again, my mind is blank because uh, it's it's deadened from lack of sleep. But um, <laughs> but yeah, there's a couple more that we're, we're screening at. So yeah, it's exciting. And where can we follow you as well as uh, the social media for Jane so we can keep up with its journey through the film festivals and for our audience members that weren't able to catch it at Holly Shorts, maybe be able to catch it at a different film festival. So uh, I believe so the Jane Instagram is at Jane underscore film underscore 2019. My Instagram is at k.prescott77. And my Twitter is at catprescott77, I think. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll like, I've usually been posting like updates when whenever the film gets into a different festival. So you can see it there definitely on the Jane Instagram, you'll be able to see um, the dates for them. We'll, we'll post the, the Phoenix dates soon as well. Oh, we're in Tacoma Film Festival right now, which I believe is coming up as well. So. Okay, see, just Jane's everywhere and I love that for her. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me today, Catherine. It was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, so nice. And yeah, I wish you all the success with Jane and I hope everyone is able to catch it at a future film festival. And yeah, just thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure talking to Catherine and I hope you enjoyed listening in. Make sure to follow the Jane short film Instagram page to stay updated on where you can catch the next screening. That's all for now. Thank you for listening in. Take it home for us, Catherine. Hi, this is Catherine Prescott. I'm the writer-director of the short film Jane, and you are listening to jeanbookner.com. Mm-hmm.